rotate device. All right, there we go. Oh. Man, I'm telling you, it's pretty, pretty amazing how awesome my filmography is in my live streams. Woo, this is like grade A production quality right here. I should, ah, oh, damn it, I did it already. My uh, image here is skipping on my phone. I don't know if it's giving for you guys or not. Anyways, I sit here and I want to wait for someone to show up before I start talking too much, but then that screws the guys that are replaying up. So I'm going to start. This is the turbine housing. This is an aftermarket turbine housing made by a company called Mambo. And you can get these on eBay um, or other places. They're built really, really well. I'm actually super impressed with them. Um, See the 20 right there? Hey, Aaron. See the 20 right there? That means something. I'm going to go over that a little bit, what that means. Just a second here. So first off, I want to talk about boost creep. What's boost creep? Boost creep is when boost goes up independent of control due to inadequate wastegate sizing. Okay? So that means that even if you did... I don't know, change wastegate duty cycle or anything, that the boost will go up without you telling them what to do. Basically what it means is this hole right here and that flapper door and the entrance into that hole is inadequate to bypass enough pressure and airflow, exhaust flow, um, around the turbine of the turbocharger and turbine speed therefore increases, which increases boost output and everything. Now, why is that bad? Well, boost creep isn't good because two main reasons. The first one being, well, shit, boost is higher than you want it to be, which means compressor speed and turbine speed is going up more than you want it to be, which means you run the possibility of overspeeding the, uh, the turbo. So I guess three. Uh, the other reason for that is, well, why is it going so fast? Well, it's going so fast because back pressure in here is high and it's so high that this can't compensate for it or it's high because this can't compensate for it. this can't let enough out and go around the turbo and therefore back pressure on the engine is high and high back pressure on an engine is bad especially at high loads and high duty cycles high back pressure increases heat retention in the cylinders and causes all kinds of other bad juju stuffs so now i have high agts i have high retained ex heat in the cylinders I am retaining more exhaust during valve overlap or even uh, after the exhaust valve is shut, there's still more exhaust in the cylinder. It causes you to lose horsepower because it takes up space that good clean charge could utilize to make horsepower for you. So there's all kinds of stuff. And the, and the last thing is for a Subaru, the uh, fuel injectors are not large enough to handle what a VF puts out airflow wise when it's creeping. So that's the fuck, I'm gonna give you three or four things there, right? So high back pressure, excessive turbine speed, inadequate fueling, I guess really three, and then those result in other things. If it's inadequate fueling, that means you're lean. If it's high back pressure, that means you're um, retaining heat in the cylinders, retaining exhaust gas, losing power, losing reliability, increasing the chance of knock, all kinds of things. And when you increase chance of knock with back pressure and heat, and you're also increasing the knock with lean AFRs because the fuel injector is too small, and you're also going to be hurting your turbocharger by spinning it too much, there's all kinds of reasons why boost creep is bad. Now, what is the normal way of fixing boost creep? Well, if you don't want to lose horsepower, then you need to put an external wastegate on the car. However, the assholes of the EPA have deemed that an external wastegate violates emissions because it allows exhaust gas to bypass the catalytic converter. Even though temporary, it allows you to do it, and therefore it is illegal. Now, does that make sense? No, I don't think that makes sense at all because the periods of time when it's bypassing are also the periods of time that the ECU is open loop. It's not controlling the air fuel ratio near stoic, and not just that, but it's... Uh, it's in an area that's not even tested, so I think it's stupid, 
that they're that they're that way. But it's the EPA. Everything they do, they fucking do for the most part around cars is pretty fucking stupid. Um, bunch of idiots over there. If you read their papers, though, they get all super technical and twist the math around to make themselves look like they know what they're talking about. But really, they're just a bunch of morons. Uh, anyway, so here you go, EPA. That's for you. Um, aside from that, aside from the EPA hate, again, external wastegates now are deemed illegal. So going to an external wastegate is, uh, it's hard to find external wastegate setups now for Subarus because no one's making them uh, because EPA is cracking down on those and TGVs and everything else. So the other option is then to lose power. I can put a more restrictive exhaust back on the car, which will alleviate the differential pressure issue across the turbo. I can put a more restrictive intake on the car, like a stock intake, and that will usually um, add enough restriction to the inlet of the turbo that boost creep won't occur. However, now I'm losing power uh, to eliminate boost creep. Then there's the really expensive option, which is just go with a bigger turbo that's got larger wastegate built into it, and it's designed to run with no back pressure, um, which means you also need injectors and a fuel pump and a tune and... If it's a GR, then you also need fuel rails because larger injectors in a GR often result in a massive multiplier in the severity of the uh, GR stumble, which is not fun either. So it becomes very expensive to go that route. So one day I was sitting here in the shop talking with Elaine. I had purchased one of these turbine housings for the G25 550 uh, hybrid clone turbo that we're putting in, in a VF. Um, because I was saying that the P18 housing that comes on the VF series turbo, most of the VF series turbos, all of the US VF series turbos, um, was already kind of small for the VF anyways, and then to add a bunch of compressor flow to it seemed silly to me because we would be choking out on the housing anyways and also having boost creep issues. So I then thought about it some more and said, let's put a bigger housing on it. And when we got the housings, the housing has a much larger wastegate in it. And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. We could use this on the VFs for the guys that don't want to deal with boost creep. Um, does it work? I don't know yet. But I'm pretty certain it does, because this wastegate is a quite a bit larger than the one in the VF. And having the bigger turbine housing means that it flows a little more airflow across it, which will reduce the back pressure on the engine and reduce the differential needed, uh, the differential that provides... Um, that extra speed that we're getting well and above our target. So I think this is going to be the one. I think this is going to be the solution. Um, so we got on the car right now. This one. That being said, we're going to get on here. We're going to, it's an STI, so it's going to be Boost Creep City normally. Uh, he was suffering from it before. Um, he, he knew he had Boost Creep because... He would be doing a pull in like third, fourth, fifth, or sixth gear or whatever. And he would get a check engine light for a boost limit exceeded over 5,000 RPM. Yeah, I usually say 45 to 55 is where they come in. Now, you can overboost, which is, just means that the boost spikes really high quickly around peak boost, which is going to be you know around 3K to 4K, somewhere in there. And an overboost is not boost creep. Overboost means that you either have the wrong pill size in your wastegate actuator, you have too much wastegate duty cycle, um, you have an error in your boost control system being like a vacuum line that's pinched off or, or the other way, open atmosphere, all kinds of things could cause a boost spike. But boost creep, it doesn't matter. You can have wastegate duty cycle. Uh, if you watch a log of boost creep is occurring, you'll see wastegate duty cycles, you know, 50 something percent or whatever it is to hit boost and that RPM and then the boost starts to go up and the target's dropping and wastegate duty cycle drops but boost keeps going up and that's usually you know over 5,000 RPM. Are you tuned for your current setup? Oh you're asking you're answering that question in the thing okay. Um, well I think that I've described what it, it is and really tuning has nothing to do with boost creep at all. Um, so, because you can't tune out boost creep. Now, a boost spike, yes, you can tune out a boost spike or fix the mechanical issue that caused the boost spike, um, which is why I usually tell, ask people when they say, oh, I've got this check engine light, tell them, did it happen in a high gear, like fourth or fifth, 
Did it happen around 5,000 RPM? Or did it happen at a much lower RPM, like three or 4,000 RPM? If it happened up at five-ish, then that's gonna be boost creep almost certainly. If it happened below that, it's probably gonna be a boost spike or overboost. Um, and that's gonna be tune or, or system related, something small that just isn't hooked up right or popped off or something like that. Um, boost spikes can occur as boost is ramping in when your wastegate um, restrictor pill, the actuator restrictor pill coming from the turbo, goes into the, that little T, there's a restrictor on the turbo side, and that controls the airflow in the boost control system. If that pill is too small, then the air cannot pressurize the wastegate actuator fast enough on a reduction in uh, wastegate due cycle and an increase in boost pressure, and that'll cause a boost spike because the air can't get in the actuator fast enough to open the door to stop the boost from spiking. But again, that happens at a lower RPM. Um, so pretty much if it happens around five grand, it's almost certainly gonna be boost creep and something that you cannot fix with a tune. So boppers late to the stream, but that's fine. The solution is, is a few things. One of them is overboost loose inlet clamp. No, loose inlet clamp, but have nothing to do with overboost. Um, that would be lean but that doesn't affect the boost control system at all. Um, especially if you already have an intake on there and you have almost no inlet restriction anyways, then uh, an inlet clamp would not be um, a, a cause of overboost. Um, so, wastegate, external wastegate for boost creep, a more restrictive exhaust, a more restrictive intake. Sometimes you can port the housing on the VF and if you do it correctly, then you can uh, um, then you can usually mitigate the effects of boost creep. Um, max boost creep PSI equals new daily boost LV solution. Yeah, it's a great solution if you have the fuel for it. But in factory form, we don't have the fuel for it. The factory injectors do not supply enough fuel for a VF when it's boost creeping. The IDC will go to 120%, but you're going to get 100%, um, and the car will run leaner and leaner, and you'll have problems. Plus, you have increased heat retention, like I said earlier. You have uh, from high back pressure, high retained exhaust gases, lower power output, etc., etc., etc. So I said, let's try this housing instead. It's a bigger housing. It'll have less back pressure. It's got a bigger uh, flapper on it. Hey, Connor made it. Welcome, Connor. Uh, it's got a bigger flap on it, so it should bypass more exhaust gas. Let me see if I have a. I know I do. I know I say I do. I know tier one does. I gotta, I gotta stop trying to claim something that doesn't mine. Although, actually, one of my housings is here, technically, so I own one of them. Where's a. Uh, uh, never mind. I found it. Oh, yeah, it's way smaller. It's smaller. Oh, you guys want to see? I'm sorry. I should probably include you guys in that. Let me, uh, let me get this side-by-side -side comparison. I'm streaming! <laughs> Make sure you swear a lot! <laughs> All right, check this out. I'm going to put side-by-side -side here so you can see the difference. Put the phone down for a second. I'm going to shit on my table. Set this down. Okay. Wow, what a difference. All right, check this out. All right, enough of my ugly mug. Watch this. This is the Mamba P20 housing for a VF. It has a bigger AR on the housing, which reduces back pressure, increases top end power, reduces um, spool, so it increases lag a little bit, but the VF spool almost too fast anyways for what they do on the top end. This makes them feel more balanced. This is the P18 as they come from IHI. Much smaller wastegate. Look at that. Look how small that is. Look how tiny that guy is. And it's cracked. You can't, you can't miss the VF crack. A little tiny door. This one, much larger hole, much larger door. This is off of VF39. 
plus the crack, most likely 39. It could be 43, 48, 54, whatever. These are the same. The same overall design, and they all tend to crack a bit. And then this is the P20 from Mamba. Much larger door. And what's even cooler about it, though, is not only is it a larger door, but it's cut better for the boost control system. So if I open this up, put my finger in here. Um, what you can see is that it's really dirty. Um, okay, so there's the door, and if I put the turbo like this, the entrance to the wastegate is out of the main stream, which is not a bad thing by any means. But this one, you can see the entrance as it necks down. It's right where the neck down happens, so the diameter pipe stays larger longer and then necks down some as the wastegate entry occurs. Now, that's great for wastegate flow. Overall, it's a little worse for flow through the turbine, but that really would mostly only be an issue if you had this gate welded shut because um, this gate's always going to be open during boost to some degree but the larger diameter of the whole thing the more volume the larger nozzle area and all that's going to mean less back pressure more top end horsepower uh, less energy needed to drive the turbo all kinds of cool stuff this one here Small little door, cracks a lot, not nearly as pretty. No. Uh, to answer the question, those was asked, would a bigger boost pill benefit anything, or is it already common or useless? Uh, it wouldn't do anything. It would just hurt you. A larger boost pill will only hurt your spool. Uh, it won't fix anything in the creep area. Like I said, there's nothing you can do aside from changing the exhaust pressure profile or increasing restriction on the turbo to control boost creep. Nothing else. There's no tuning. There's no boost control system you can change this unless it's, like I said, an external wastegate, which adds another very large wastegate um, to the system to bypass exhaust gas or increase the restriction so that the uh, difference of pressure across the turbine is not so great and you don't have that problem anymore. And that's it. That's all you can do. Any asshole that tells you you can tune out boost creep is a fucking liar. You cannot tune it out. Now, you can stop the check engine light from coming in. Right? I mean, you can definitely stop the check engine light from coming in. Is that a good idea? Probably not. You're like, oh, I don't have boost creep anymore. I got my, got my tune fixed. Now I have no boost creep. Well, <laughs> uh, I mean, you could add injectors to a car uh, and then just raise the limit so that that code doesn't come in. And then... When it creeps, you're like, whatever, I got the fuel for it. And just keep enough fuel on it that it isn't an issue. But that doesn't fix the back pressure issue. And it doesn't fix the reduction in power you get during boost creep. So, um, I don't know. You can fix it or you can try and band-aid it. I prefer to fix it personally. That's the wrong button. I wanted to do the chat. Uh, let's see. La, 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 la. Thanks. You recommend the Mamba over SoCal porting? Absolutely. Any day of the week. Absolutely. I would definitely recommend the Mamba housing over SoCal porting. What's my favorite street turbo? That would be a Dom 1.5. That's my favorite street turbo. Turbine wheel can fix a bunch. Mamba announced? I mean, it's already been a thing, right? I already have one. I have the G25 550 hybrid clone in a VF already that's going in the white car. Um, I bought a Mamba housing for it, but yeah, I already have that. So I wouldn't say they had, they didn't come up with it. They didn't announce it. They're just the ones that are selling what this other guy's already been doing. It's a full 25 made by Mamba. So you're saying it's using the actual G25 wheels, exactly. And then they're changing the housing to fit. The, the both housings, compressor and exhaust. Are you sure? Because almost everybody right now is taking the G25 wheel, milling about a millimeter off the outside of it, um, stuffing it in the VF housing, and then taking the 550 compressor style, not even the 550 compressor, they're point milling it like the 550 compressor because it's got the same geometry not a drop in oh well okay so we're not talking about the same thing 
at all. All right. Yeah, T3, T4, I don't give a shit. I just buy the, buy the G25. Uh, the question is asked, why does a different gear affect boost creep? I know it's more creep in fourth versus third. The answer is simply time. It's time. That's it. It's time. Some people are, are short going to say, oh, it's load. Well, oh, it's air pressure. It's No, it's, it's not that. It's just time. The turbo has more time to sit there and spool and feed itself and back pressure to go up. In the lower gears, you rip through gear too fast. You shift, RPMs are down again, you're through a gear, you pass through it. Each, each gear gets worse and worse because you spend more time in it. You spend more time in it because of friction and air resistance and all that, but really it's just a matter of time. If I put it on the dyno and I put it in, say, third gear, and I loaded it up so it couldn't pass through, right, and I held the RPM 5,000, I put my foot down, it would creep. It would eventually do it. It just needs time. And in those higher gears, there's just more time for the turbo to feed itself and keep going. Why is it here? Uh, Facebook, one of your emails to him about the dam. Yeah, I'm sure he probably misunderstood what I said. Um, he had his dam dropping on the base map. I tried to tell him it wasn't the end of the world. That's how the system works. That the internet has convinced everybody that the dam has to stay at 1.0. Um, but honestly, everyone's fucking ignorant as shit. And they don't know how the dam even works. Um, and I explained to him what fine knock learning was. And I think that's what he misunderstood. The most was a fine knock learning was. Um, I told him it's like a fuel trim. Um, and uh, that you can get feedback knock and fine knock learn and your dam may or may not drop. It depends on a bunch of other parameters. It isn't just a fixed thing. So uh, it's, it's too complex of a topic for almost every Subaru owner, to be completely honest with you, because there are so many things about it. The, the triggers that, that cause it to drop the uh, the advance delay, the retard delay, the advanced retard quantities, how the maps overlay on each other, you know, which threshold you're in, which map you're in. I mean, there's a lot of things uh, going on with the dam feedback knock and fine knock learning that most owners, most enthusiasts, you know, aren't going to understand anyways because it ties into so many other things. So. All the tuners have tried to dumb it down enough, and Cobb's tried to make posts about it. Everyone's tried to simplify it so people understand it, but there's still this idea that it has to be a 1.0. And I tell people all the time from the factory, they're never a 1.0. They're almost never 1.0, especially not an FA. An FA from the factory lives life at like 0 0.3 uh, on the factory tune. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know why people keep spreading misinformation. I guess that's a lie. I've, I've seen what's happened with our society in this day and age, so I guess that's a lie. I, I, do, I do see why. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, chances are pretty good that I was misinterpreted uh, in that post. Look at the phone. There we go. I'm trying to undo my, my cable. And I heard about it. I know who posted it. Stoss Etheridge. Him and his brother, nice guys. They're enthusiasts for sure, um, but they're not the most tech savvy of my customers at all. So it's hard because some of them where I have to repeat myself a lot or explain things over and over again and, and try and get them to understand where I'm coming from. But a lot of these subjects are very, very deep. You know, there's a lot of aspects to all of them and very few things in this car or in the ECU operate independently. There's very few things that are like, oh, well, this is just simply this. There's nothing like that. Everything ties in with everything. And in order to understand how it all works, you have to kind of understand everything. So it's uh, difficult for a tuner to tell their customer and explain to them how all these systems work, uh, which is kind of why I have my channel. I try and break all these little things down and I mean, obviously, more lately, we do more live streams and stuff, but I have my educational videos where I break things down. I have the whiteboard. I have graphs. I have all kinds of stuff. And I also have my Discord channel where I do the same thing, where I try and teach everybody um, the fundamentals of tuning, of how engines work, how the systems work, 
Um, we, get, we get some discussions on physics. We have all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, I did the big one on heat transfer and how it applies to intercoolers and radiators and all that stuff. Um, I have lessons on ignition advance, what it really is, and why more is not better. Um, but everyone thinks, oh, just run the most advanced you can. That's the answer. And that's not the answer. Um, so I have lessons on just exactly what you're doing. I have lessons in chemistry, um, with products and reactants, and um, octane, and how that's affected, and uh, cam timing, uh, boost control, all kinds of stuff in there. So uh, I try and break the systems down and get people to understand them better so that they can spread actual factual information and not misinformation and stuff. But obviously, I only have 100 some people on my Discord server. And there are 100,000 plus Subaru owners. So I do not have a very large reach. And I only have like 2,000 something subscribers in my channel. So my reach is not very large. So I can only, you know, quell so much misinformation and help so many people at once. Um, wish it was more, but I get it. I'm not dramatic enough. I talk to you guys too much. Sometimes I'm too technical. Um, so it's just not a channel for everybody. But. I don't plan on changing it too much. Uh, hopefully I can show more cool cars and more experimentation, more product development, uh, and as well as keep up with the little mini tuning sessions and lessons that I provide and hope everybody likes it. So enough of that. Today is going to be about the Mamba housing. I did that. Now I'm going to test it on this car. I was really hoping that I would get to provide you guys with comparison numbers between turbos uh, or similar cars, but unfortunately, this guy has fitment. Um, he's got flares and 275s and all of that, which means the power is not going to be representative of anything else out there because the more rubber and wheel you're turning, the lower the power reading is. So this car is already going to take a 20 to 25 wheel horsepower kick in the nuts because he's got gigantic wheels and tires on it. So that already is going to cause it to, to read low. Um, and then, you know, I, I have no way of quantifying how good it's going to be in the turbo. But what I can do is do pulls on it and do pulls with zero wastegate duty cycle. And you can see the boost curve and then increase the duty cycle and see the boost curve. I, did, I have a video on YouTube described or called dangerous boost creep on VFs. And I describe how it works, and I show a boost curve on a car with boost creep at zero wastegate duty cycle. The boost comes along, and then it goes up, and then falls again when it should have stayed flat the whole way until it eventually fell some. But it doesn't. It goes up. So I'll be able to put this at zero wastegate duty cycle, do the same thing, and see where the boost goes. If the boost has the same bloop at the end, then we know the car is going to suffer from creep on the top end. If the boost is flat and then tapers like it's supposed to, then we know that this housing is absolutely going to work. So that is about as good as I can do. I can't show the power gains because these tires are gigantic and um, I won't have a baseline on this car without the housing to do it. Now, if it was, you know, a normal 06 STI with normal fitment, then the number of cases that I have tuned is tremendous. And there is a pretty good average of what the car should make on this dyno. Um, you see here, you got Cobb SF, got a downpipe, got a throwback exhaust, factory injectors, factory TGVs. And that's it. IAG, AOS, you know, typical stuff, but that's it. Not a ton of mods to it, engine wise. But enough, sorry, I thought I saw something, that it should perform well and enough that it would definitely creep normally. Um, what is that? Oh, it's a foot. I think it's one of the fans. One of those guys. A little feetsy. All right, put that back there. All right, is the door open in the back? It is not. Okay, so I gotta open the dyno door uh, to the plenum. And then we're going to tune this thing and do the testing. Like I said, we're going to start off at zero wastegate duty cycle. Because zero wastegate duty cycle will give us an idea of the trends. Hey. What? 
Hi. Hello. Get the keys. Key for the door. Can you give me the, give the door for me? Thank you. It's like that guy showed up on the day that one dude was supposed to come fight me, right? And the guy showed up in the waiting area, an older dude. I'm like, are you Scott? And he was like, no. I'm like, have a nice day. <laughs> I was all aggressive. He was like, no. <laughs> the look on his face was like, uh. <laughs> I was like, have a nice day. Right? If he wasn't the right Scott, I fucking knocked him out on the spot right there. Are you Scott? Yeah. Boom! And then he's like, wakes up a while, a while later, like, what the fuck did I do? <laughs> I, I think I would just like smell him first and be like, you know, smell like alcohol. You can't be the guy. You didn't show up drunk. All right. Doors open. I see light to the plenum. All right. Oh yeah, fans. I plug the fans in the front. Ugh, one of them is missing the ground strap. That's the one with the switch that works. The one with the ground pin is the one with the switch that doesn't work. And that's not intentional, that's just the way it the way it happens. Alright. I'm gonna put this down so I can get everything set up. Ah. Do -do -do. Stay, phone. All right. Unfortunately, this is an 06, which means the green connectors are going to need to be actuated many times. Oh, wait, maybe not. It's got a base map on it. I think. Maybe not. I don't remember now. Ooh, sticky key. All right, so we got some DCCD codes on this thing for some reason. I don't know what that reason is, but... Flash DC CD light means DC CD issues. So, sucks for him. I don't know what the issue is yet. You gotta get a factory scan tool to read the DC CD uh, codes. And I know we used to have one here, but I think it got stolen, if I recall correctly. Um, another benefit of the larger, excuse me, larger housing is a slightly deeper exhaust note. A larger turbine housing with more nozzle area means 
less restriction, and less restriction means more noise. For the most part, uh, anytime you use restriction, you increase noise because the sound waves are able to get down the pipe better. Uh, and something else too, something about air density. I don't know. I'll have to think about that one. I remember my CTSV, um, I had a supercharged CTSV. It was a version of one that didn't come supercharged and I built the motor, I stroked it like a dumbass. Um, I got such a good deal on the stroke kit, I just couldn't pass it up. And it was the wrong thing to do, but it was a blower for the stroke kit, so it made a fucking heap of torque. Um, but what was weird about it is the boost would climb towards the end. Now, that's typical if you have uh, like, you know, a, a Vortex supercharger, you know, something that's centrifugal. But this was a, a Magnuson MP, were they 113s or something like that, right? It was an old, an old turbo, or old turbo, an old blower, Gen 3, I think, or Gen 2 or Gen 3 blower. And it didn't normally, Why is that beeping? The doors are shut. Does this year beep from the seatbelt? I don't remember that. Maybe it does. I don't know. It does. Oh, I, I didn't think that was no six thing. Oh, six thing. I usually don't hear it. It just. I don't even notice it anymore. Um, but I was trying to make sure that you guys didn't have to deal with the constant beeping sound, so. Um, anyways, the boost would climb up, and that was weird. That's not what a roots type blower should do. Um, and so I thought about that, and I said, well, why would that happen? Well, the only reason is a restriction. It could be an intake restriction, that's possible, uh, or it could be an exhaust restriction. And I was like, I bet it's exhaust restriction. I have a MagnaFlow two and a half inch X pipe off of my Cook's headers. And I was like, I wonder if it's that, if it's that X pipe. So I got into the car, I looked at the X pipe, and I looked at it and I go, you know what? I think that is it. Because that X pipe, uh, it's two two and a halfs that come in and the way they X together, they combine to be far less than two two and a halfs would be. Um, and I was like, you are probably my culprit. So I bought a three inch X pipe and had Randy's uh, ring and pinion over there in Marysville. I had them do, um, Randy's exhaust, sorry, um, do the uh, three inch pipe for me. And the car was way louder. I mean, significantly louder. Um, not like a couple decibels, like it was louder. It, um, to the point where I was like, oh shit, like these mufflers might not be enough on this car. It went from sounding really quiet to having a significant audible lope and um, it sounded like a freaking race car. It was way louder. And all I did was change the X-pipe diameter, right? That's it. And it was, it was a tremendous difference. Um, so the same thing can be said with turbine housing. You go with a much bigger aftermarket turbo, the gigantic housing, you're going to get more noise out the exhaust. People hear it all the time. They put a rotate turbo kit on their car like, wow, it's, my car's louder. Same muffler, same everything else behind it, but with that bigger turbo and the bigger housing, more volume. It is a fucking oven in here. Oh, I had the heat turned up. All right, engine is just about warm, so I'm gonna start driving it here in a second. Obviously, I need to connect to the uh, access port and see what's going on. I'm gonna check the chat while this thing talks. What does chat say? Oh, a lot. I missed a bunch. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Blanc offers eight or ten housing. The spool much worse than the ten. Any experience with the two five or three O XTR? Uh, back to turbos. Okay, so um, the ten definitely makes more power, and the eight definitely spools faster. I'm gonna simple. That's, that's all like we said. That's as you'd expect. It's always that way. Two five or three O. Um, they're good turbos. Okay, Blanc makes good turbos. I like block turbos over FP turbos when it comes to factory location stuff. The problem is anything over a DOM 1.5 is a fucking waste. The stock location, the factory fitment, 
to get the housings, the compressor housings, small enough to fit back there, the turbine housing geometry to fit in the stock location is so restrictive that you get a, a turbo that lags more than a rotated turbo almost twice its size, right? It makes no sense to me to run anything over a Dom 1.5. Um, and I've had customers twist my arm and make me say, well then run a Dom 3.0 or something. And then when the car performs like shit, I go, see how bad it performs? They're like, well, you told me to get that turbo. Like, motherfucker, no, I did not. No, I did not tell you to get that turbo. I told you that no matter what turbo you fucking put on that car, it's gonna suck if it's bigger than a Dom 1.5. It's gonna be laggy. It's not gonna perform like you want. It's gonna be rated for whatever they rate their factory turbos for you. FP's numbers are bullshit. Block's numbers are closer, but still close to bullshit. Every China Bay turbo's numbers are bullshit. BCP 500's fucking bullshit. All those numbers are bullshit because that's what the compressor wheel can flow. That's not at all what the turbo's capable of. Like you're limited by the housings and the geometry and force into that spot. It sucks, okay? I have had I have cars on here all the time. Dom 3.0 makes high 300s, low 400s to the wheels. It lags, you get full boosted like 45 to 5,000 RPM. I got turbos that make 700 wheel that have a, almost 2,000 RPM less lag than that, right? It's extremely important that if you want big horsepower on a stock location, you gotta change fucking everything and you might as well just go rotate in the first place. So my favorite street turbo, Dom 1.5 in stock location. Outside of that, absolutely a G25 550 or a G3660 for a car I'm gonna drive all the time in a rotated configuration. Stock location sucks, just plain and simple. It sucks. Um, but that being said, I'm trying to make it suck slightly less on this VF by reducing the boost creep tendencies. That's why I'm putting this, this housing on there. Put this housing on there for the boost creep correction with the added benefit of possibly picking up more power and having this move the power band. But the biggest thing is the boost creep correction. Um, the power that we gain, we're gonna gain not because of airflow, because if we push more mass air into the engine, then we will use more fuel and we'll run out of fuel anyways. And we talked about that's already a problem, but what we'll gain, we'll gain in reduction in back pressure. Why does back pressure hurt power? Back pressure hurts power because the exhaust stroke, the piston is moving up and it's compressing the exhaust, right? That's where the turbo gets its power from. It gets its power from the piston on the exhaust stroke. People go, oh, it's free energy in the exhaust or whatever fucking bullshit someone thinks about turbos. Um, no, it's not free energy in the exhaust. The power comes from a little bit of the heat, but each of these turbo are still pretty fucking high. Uh, and then you have the mass leaving the engine, imparting, energy on the turn blades and how's that mass leave the engine with the piston pushing it up so uh, when you reduce the back pressure the amount of force the piston has to use which is direct horsepower from the crankshaft has to squeeze it out if you think about your exhaust pressure say it's 40 we'll say it's 40 uh, psi which is actually a pretty conservative estimate of exhaust pressure on a vf at 40 psi and you have uh, around 12 square inches of piston 40 times 12, what is that, 48, 480 pounds of force pushing down on that piston. Well, that 480 pounds of force pushing down that piston comes off that crankshaft. Now, if I can reduce the back pressure to 20, now it's 240 pounds of force pushing down that piston, resisting the crankshaft rotation. So you lose half as much horsepower drive in the turbocharger because you've, lo you've lowered your back pressure. Um, so if we do gain power from this housing, then we're gaining power because we're reducing the back pressure. Um, now, that being said, you can push more air with a reduction in back pressure. That's how it works. The problem is our ceiling for airflow is still the same because our ceiling for fuel flow is still the same because we haven't changed our injectors or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I hope that makes sense. Hope you guys follow that. So overall, the goal is no more boost creep, and then, hey, we should also gain some power out of it. That's kind of what we're going with today. So, okay, now this is an 06 STI. And I don't think I put a base map on this thing yet, but let's find out. Here, I'll just show you the guys the access port. Pretty sure it's on a stage two map or something like that. So we'll go to tune, right here. 
then we'll go down to show current map and stage one okay so he's on a stage one map from Cobb version 400 I didn't know version 400 came out is that a Cobb map or is that modified by somebody oh, looks like Cobb description I thought we were still in 300s shows you how often I use those tunes I don't use them very often at all um, I honestly like the old Cobb tunes better than the new Cobb tunes not that new ones cause any problems I just I prefer some of the old the way they did it before okay so I need to uh, zero out the way skate duty cycle now it's a cop map it's unlocked I can technically get into it just by just by connecting to it so that's what we're gonna do we're just gonna connect to it and I'm gonna zero the way skate duty cycle and we're going to see what it does I'm not gonna change anything from the cop tune no timing none of that just lower the way skate duty cycle and see what she does on the dyno for boost curve and power do they have the boost lineup yes okay All right, so we're going to go to the Whiskey Duty Cycle. We're going to hit zero on this. Bloop. And we're going to hit this guy. And we're going to zero on this. And we're going to go to the boost target. And we're just going to put nine in here. Now, the, technically, this shouldn't do anything. This here shouldn't do anything. Whiskey Duty Cycle is already zeroed. It shouldn't change anything by making that nine because we're already at zero on the waste gates. But if for some reason I, I goofed up and like forgot to zero something out or... Uh, like the low. If I forget the low, zero the low or the high and it starts to add duty cycle, I don't want that. So I want to uh, just nine. Um, I mean, the system should work pretty simply. This that's zero. It should be zero. Uh, but just to back myself up, I'm doing that anyways. And that's it. That's the only change we're going to make to the car. And then we're going to see what it does on the wastegate and see what the boost curve looks like. Uh, but before I do that, I have to calibrate the tack for the dyno. So let me uh, set that. Take this guy, move the down to speed control, set it to 60, and then we're gonna go to 60 mile per hour in the test gear, which is, oh, oh my God. My God! Dude, these aftermarket rubber floor mats are just cancer. These weather techs too, ugh. I hate these things on the Subarus. They like overhang the pedals and they clip your heels and the back of the pedal and everything. Like logging parameters here. Let me do that real quick. Logging parameters. Check the barrel. Calculate the load. Command and fuel final. Multiplier. RPM. Feedback knock. Find knock learning. Take air temp. Mass airflow, relative pressure, there's fucking all of them. Yeah, that should be enough. Whiskey duty, make sure that it's zeroed out, and that should do it. Okay. Net zero, okay, that works for me. ABCS is tracking so far. Uh, find knock learning, see now, okay, here's an example. Does that mean the car is knocking right now? No, it does not. It's important that people understand that. Does that mean it's pulling timing because it's knocking? No, it means it learned to pull timing. That's the exact same thing as this. Only this is a fuel trim, that's an ignition trim. The car has learned, hey, the fueling is better if I pull 1% out of it right here. In this case, oh, that's correction, that's right here, sorry, learning. It's said, hey, it's better if I add 3% right here. Okay, it's the same thing with the fine knock learning. That one spot, it has learned that pulling 1.4 produces less knock during operation okay that happening is good now obviously zero would be great because that means that it never knocked in that area but this means the system works and it's smooth at an area that may have already been slightly aggressive and it fixed it it's no longer a problem okay now what a tuner can do is he can go in here and he can bring up this table up here uh, da, 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 right here and see what the car learns and if you look at here it's only learned to pull in that spot but I can fucking guarantee you that at some point whoever tuned not this car in particular but obviously somebody has that they would go hey I got negative one for my knock learning that's where it learned to pull it in a super light low low rpm area completely fucking irrelevant like I would tell somebody that, that is the most acceptable thing ever don't care don't waste my time even send me an email for that because that is absolutely nothing to worry about nothing at all all right. Uh, 
speaking of nah, la, 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 la. Okay, I'm back to the comments real quick. Loving the company mod. I assume it means cooling mod. I appreciate that. Thank you. Speaking of knock, I noticed knock control is turned off on my Series 2 2005 STI. I don't know what that means. Are you saying like you have an AEM Series 2 ECM and you're 05 STI and they turn off knock control? That would be weird. Uh, rip engine. Uh, sweet vintage shirt. Thanks, Cody. Appreciate it. Hold on, bud. Super guys are not the most tech savvy. No way. Igor, I love you, buddy. I love you, Igor. I know that you've been dealing with some bullshit lately, so I understand your skepticism. Uh, hey, John. John from Hawaii. Mr. Infect. What's up, buddy? Hope you're doing well. When are we going to work on that car of yours, dude? Like, we, we got like a three quarters of the way there, and then nothing's been fucking going on. Build tire it makes a difference. Yes, it does. Intake, laugh my ass off. It's like a mesh sleeve with a band at the end. I don't know which one you're talking about, but okay. Uh, the reason you listen are the exact reason why I listen to you. Oh, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Four minutes ago. <laughs> Dom tuned my 3 with 10 centimeter housing. My blog made 520 on my dyno. Can you rotate the stock station setup, or do you need a new turbo and rotated kit? Uh, there's no point in rotating a stock location turbo because the housings are restricted. The housings are smaller, more compact, and they're restrictive overall. So the housings are the problem. Not the fact that it sits in stock location, but because the housings needed to put it in the stock location are the problem. Taking the turbo and moving it around doesn't make a difference. Um, obviously, the turbo inlet is a bit of a factor of that. The, the turbocharger inlet. Uh, on the Subaru, even aftermarket ones are relatively restrictive. The factory one especially, I mean, it's a small tube that goes under the manifold, takes a 90 degree turn behind the power steering pump, and it pinches down behind the power steering pump. So those things all affect, um, they all affect the performance of stock location where the uh, rotating turbos would absolutely stomp on them. New tunes have correction put back in for the rear O2. Interesting. Um, uh, they also don't have the 420 code deleted. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that's what we're gonna see. Um, new tunes, uh, Auto Tragic? No, this one's a manual, but I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, uh, back to Subaru, something a little less labor intensive. Right, Matt? Yeah, oh, there's your car, by the way. I took it for a drive. It, uh, it was okay. So I, I flashed on the map, it's sitting right there with the new map flashed on, I haven't driven it yet. Um, I made a small change to it to try and clean the fuel trims. But unfortunately, the definitions that I found don't have anything for the mass airflow sensor as far for the BMW. As far as calibrating that mass airflow sensor housing you have, I would really like to increase the mass airflow sensor housing calibration uh, to, to compensate for the fact that it's always run a positive trim, which usually means the calibration is wrong, but there's nothing available for that car for some reason. I don't know what that is. Okay, let's see. Um, AM Series 2 notes the knock control says off. Not sure why. Knock volts max is 0.1 usually. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's cool. I guess. Um, I I wouldn't want my knock control turned off. Uh, unless I was on E85, then fuck it. It's fine. Um, 0.1 volts. That totally depends on how everything is set up. So that doesn't necessarily tell me anything. Um, there's supposed to be a gain option there where you set the gain and then you listen to it and you see how loud it is when you rev it and then you you know you adjust with all kinds of stuff um, to get the knock control correct also you want a certain frequency band you know, like six to nine thousand hertz or maybe seven to ten thousand hertz and then you want to have a window of operation um, so that it uh, only listens for a certain time, so you're not catching intake valves or exhaust valves closing and opening and all that kind of stuff. So the knock control system is pretty complex. It's way more than just one voltage, and you definitely want to have it set up right or you're not going to get uh, the results you're looking for. Um, anybody ever notice on the V8 when you put headers on it, you hear this ticking sound through the headers, and they say, oh, it's the header sound. That's the, I want the header sound, right? With the tick, tick, tick as it's you know, rumbling away. That's the exhaust valve shutting that you're hearing. You're hearing the exhaust valve go smack against the seat on the head. So if you can hear it outside the car, imagine what the knock sensor hears when it's bolted to the block, right? I mean, it, that, that exhaust valve is smacking into the head 
which is made of aluminum and it's hard bolted to a chunk of aluminum that is the block, right? So that sound travels really good through solid materials. Uh, so you can imagine how much sound the knock sensor picks up. So if you have the knock sensor listening at the point in time when that valve closes, you're gonna have a voltage spike that's going, oh, I hear knock, but it's not. It's the exhaust valve shutting. And unfortunately, valve shutting make noise in the same band that uh, detonation makes. Now I say that very generically because cylinder bore diameter affects knock frequency dramatically, as does intake, uh, as does, um, sorry, I read a chat, which fucked me up, uh, as does the material that the head's made out of, the block's made out of, the interface between them, uh, how big the valve is in relation to that, all that stuff. All that stuff will affect the frequency that's produced by it. Um, the travel time, how fast it happens, all kinds of stuff. So that uh, that's a very generic thing to say, but you know, the engines, traditionally the valve event happens really close to the knock window or even in the knock window uh, for time in crankshaft degrees, as well as in the frequency range that the knock sensor is listening to. So it's uh, a challenge for manufacturers to get knock sensors and knock control calibrated in a way that they don't trip because of valve shedding or the compressor for your air conditioning turning on. If you have an FA, you know damn well, turn on your air conditioner, trips a knock event every time, almost every time, okay? Uh, so, that kind of thing. Uh, to answer the question, do I think the intake's causing issues? Yes, I do. Um, not that it's a bad intake, just that I don't have any way of adjusting the mass airflow calibration for the intake and therefore the fueling's off. So yeah, I think that's, uh, that is causing some issues. Um, I need to go through some other tuning places and see if they have math corrections. Mine software has a gross scale change of the fuel scaler, which works. It's what I implemented in yours in this last flash to knock down the fuel trims. Um, but that's more of a speed density kind of adjustment. Uh, it's not as much of a low detection type of adjustment like mass airflow is. Um, my software also has mass airflow ranges that are, you know, ceilings and floors uh, based on ratios of like what it should consider to be an error for the mass airflow sensor, but it doesn't have mass airflow sensor calibration uh, in it. And that's, uh, that's the issue that one of the issues that we're having, one of the many issues unfortunately we're having. Okay, make, make sure there's no more comments and we'll get to the test. The car's warm now, uh, I need to go to 60. Go to 60. Right about 4400. I'll calibrate that so the dyno knows that at that speed I'm at 4400 RPM. Uh, RPM, engine RPM to wheel speed is a linear relationship based on the gear ratios and tire diameter, and final drive ratio. That being said, that doesn't compensate for issues with tire growth or tire expansion um, during a pull. Some tires grow a lot more than others or shrink a lot more than others based on their uh, construction. Okay, so now we're gonna do a low boost pull at zero WCD cycle and see what we get. or what but man I smell a lot of oil smoke right now a lot of oil smoke it is a freshly assembled turbo so there could be some uh, oil on the housings and all of that so my log there it goes so I had a knock event right at 67 right at the end of the pole negative two right there uh, commanded fuel was rich at 11 one we'll see what actually happened but I am seeing a slight rising trend here on the turbo. So it's a late rising trend, much later than usual boost creep, um, but it is still rising, which 
means that this thing could potentially suffer from a little bit of boost creep a little bit it's not like uh, the other housings where this thing right here it's gonna be like way higher and if you see the boost curve let's get over there holy shit 261 oh wrong window wow Wow, that's um, that's really surprising. 261. See, the boost curve is almost flat. There's a little lift as we're going up in the RPM. Um, so it's not as good as I'd hoped, but it's still way better than the stock. The stock, they will, as they start low, this is my zoom in finger, and they go bloop, and they'll go up really high right here. Um, like five pounds higher, not two pounds higher than that so it's not a perfect solution but that is way better and wow that blows me away 261 that's high for this dyno and especially for those big ass tires on here so that housing made a difference wow and the air fuel ratio is a little leaner over here than commanded Just a little bit. It's good on the top end. Huh. So I think the uh, the power increase is more than I anticipated. And the boost control is slightly less than I anticipated. I mean, that gate is way larger than that other one. So I think that that's an improvement. I, I do suspect, this is what I was kind of worried about before. I didn't tell you guys about it yet. Let's bring it now. I was concerned that the reduction in back pressure would make the wastegate less effective right that's difference of pressure forcing to the gate so if i have lower back pressure i need a larger gate to get the same amount of airflow so i was thinking to myself look sir i'm hmm, i want the wastegate's going to be big enough even with this going on um, but that boost grip is really flat and that's really good now what i'm going to do though that's what the turbo is spinning at the rpm needs to spin to do like eight and a half pounds at the beginning of the pull I'm gonna add some basically a duty cycle to it. And that's gonna be a, that's gonna be the, the true uh, telltale at the end here. What will happen uh, is as I add boost, back pressure will go up. That gate now being larger might pass a little more airflow than the small. Well, definitely pass more airflow than the small. Um, that might be adequate in controlling boost completely at the slightly higher loads. It might not be. So we'll find out. So we're gonna have to do a second to it. But first, I'm gonna adjust the timing curve a smidge because it's on the OTS map and I have my own curves that I like to run as a starting point. Um, to make a couple changes to that. Uh, I mean, this curve wasn't terrible. Um, oh, my hand is scrambling. Uh, 400 or four carb certification. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Uh, four FPR works amazing, by the way. Hey, man, you're welcome. It's a great, it's a great regulator, honestly. It's that's the only one I run now. Like this is. It works. They use better materials, it has better diaphragm material. It's uh, more pliable, longer lasting, more chemical resistance, handles more pressure. They have faster responding valve seats. You can get the two eye um, with the ceramic ball, or you get the one eye with the, what is it? They have two different, they have a steel and a composite ball or something like that in the one that you can get. Um, but yeah, the ceramic in the two is what I like to get. But the one's still really good. I mean, the one's better than like, almost every other regulator on the market. So the two is better than every other regulator on the market for that size and flow rate. Um, F2I is really good. Um, I really like it. Um, well, that doesn't, that doesn't surprise. So, so if you're not seeing the chat, uh, Ashton says that the 4FBR works really good. That's what answering us with statement there. And he says the Cobb fuel pressure differential kit somehow has carb certification. I don't know why it wouldn't. I wouldn't say somehow, that's, it doesn't cause the car to consume more fuel. It doesn't cause the car to have different emissions. It doesn't affect emissions at all. If anything, it helps by fixing transients in fuel pressure, which would create transients in um, AFR, which will increase emissions. So technically the co fuel pressure compensation improves the emissions of the vehicle and not uh, not reducing them. So since it's an emissions improver, then I see no reason why it wouldn't have a carb cert. That's pretty 
I mean, a cane and intake is a carb sir, and that definitely affects power output, that definitely affects emissions, that definitely affects AFR, that definitely affects everything else, and they get a, um, uh, a carb sir on that. So, something that absolutely improves the way the car runs, I don't see how that wouldn't give a uh, carb sir. Boy, this e brake is fucking hammered. This lever goes all the way up, like the legs on my ex wife. All the way up. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, interesting. The airflow is only 230, and we managed to pull 260 wheel out of it. That's not typical for this dyno and this configuration at all. Um, and that's a testament, I think, to the reduced back pressure. Considering that one, we got gigantic losing tires on it. Air fuel ratio is on target at peak horsepower, which means it is following by that. I think this housing is making a lot more power than I uh, than I thought it would. Wow, that's pretty good. I saw a chat message come up. What do we got? FP differential is life. <laughs> I tell people how good it is, how important it is, especially in post start, man. When, it, when the engine post starts, and fuel pressure goes really high, um, and you have bigger injectors on there, it is a savior for that. Igor's problem is his car. He has a he has that uh, rich running. Even with the FBR comp, it can't correct it well enough because the minimum injector pulse width gets hit uh, as it pulls down. And then it's that minimum pulse width of 0.4 or 0.36 or whatever it is. Um, if I lower that minimum pulse width, it could help the post start when it's cold. But when he's driving it warm and if it goes into that zone, it'll probably make it run like butt. And uh, we don't want to run like butt when he's driving it normally. Um, I'd rather that it sputtered a smidge on cold start than a warm start. Now, when he goes to a standalone, we're not going to have both of his gigantic fuel pumps running 100% at post start, and so that problem will go away. It'll be perfect. So um, he has a standalone now, and I'm excited to uh, get it on his car and get it tuned because I love me some standalones. I just heard some shit fall down in the shop. Hopefully no one's hurt. That's a lot of timing. Man, factory maps and the cop maps, they show up with a lot of timing on them. Especially that one, Jesus. 4,000 RPM, 22 degrees of timing at peak boost. No thanks. I don't, I don't know many engines that enjoy that. Okay, so I'm adding boost right now, and I am adding whiskey duty cycle to do that. I reduced the timing because I don't like the timing. Um, I'm changing cam timing a little bit too. I feel that they don't have quite enough in there in a few areas. They definitely like more than they have in there, at least with my experience. Um, faster spool can be had for sure with a little bit more, as well as more torque um, down low. Um, with a little more cam advance than they come with, so gotta bump that up. Let's make this 20 right there. Yeah, that's only 20 right there. That's crazy. Let's go 25 on this bitch. And that should give us a power curve that that should like. Um. Hey, what's the boost limit? Gotta bump that up. Let's go too low. Save this map. Oh, 
this guy's name again? Austin. Fucking blown up. Smell oil again. How many miles on this thing? 167,000 miles. A lot of miles right there. Let's see. Okay. Uh, no knocks on that pole, so that's good news. No knock there. Got that tamed down a little bit. Mass airflow went up to 246, 248. Horsepower went up 20 horse. Yeah, check out that. See what I mean? There we go. We're about 20 horse. Uh, right now showing is air fuel and boost. Uh, and then just peak horse on the top, right? That's not the horsepower curve. We'll do that in a second. But boost is not creeping. It comes up and tapers down smoothly. That is fucking great news right there, let me tell you. And that's really good news. It's not even trying to creep. I mean, like, look how flat the thing is just a line. Straight down. So that is good, good news. That's only, wow, that's only 16 and a half, 17 PSI peak. And we're at 280 on this dyno. That is a stupid amount of power on this dyno for a factory turbo. Damn. That's really good. Let's zoom back out. Look at that white screen. Yeah. Let's see. Feedback. I'm not for pressure. What does it say on the ECU? We hit 16.4. Wow. Dude, these cycles a little high though. These cycles a little high. 65%. We're getting up there in the in the digits. On the top end, 77. Okay, time for a lesson. This is good. This is actually a great indicator. Um, Boost is a function of back pressure. Boost is a function of back pressure. Think about that for a minute, okay? How much boost you get depends on how much back pressure there is. And I don't mean in just the way the turbocharge spins. What I mean is back pressure is restriction to airflow and boost is an indication of that restriction. So for the same flow rate, if I have more back pressure, I will have higher boost. For the same flow rate, if I reduce the back pressure, I will have lower boost. Does that make sense? So what I have here in this car is 248 grams per second of air moving through this thing. I got a 78% wastegate duty cycle which means it's trying really damn hard to add boost, but it's not. And the top and the peak boost here, I've got 16.4 with 65% wasted duty cycle. So it's trying to boost um, and we're not getting it. It doesn't even make it power, right? Because we reduced the back pressure. So even if our airflow was the same, say our compressor is maxed out, our airflow is the same, and I reduce the back pressure, the boost number is going to drop. Sorry, there's a tow truck here. Towing a car. Oh, this is ugly. Make sure the guys are helping out here. Oh, 
Hope it's not rear wheel dollars. Yep, it is. Thank goodness. Who that is? It's a drop off for a Monday appointment. Okay. Is it broken? I mean, it's towed in. I'm live. Uh, it drives. But, but he said fun. it had a. He was going up in Chatteroy. He was going over like washboard dirt road. And third second, he went and died, and it was for can failure to communicate, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he said he read something online, you know, and to clear the uh, reset DCU, and he said it fixed it for a couple days, and then it's running like crap again. Bummer. Yeah. I wonder what kind of wire abrasion we're going to have to fucking find in that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an FA. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds fun. Not but really. It's almost good if like a walnut blast, it said something about motor leak, and then diagnosis. I'm like, it's more than a diagnosis. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it is a diagnosis, but yeah. it's a diagnosis. It's going to be hell. a deep dive, so. Yeah. All right. Ashton, housing this car is the Mamba. P20 housing. Um, that was what this whole thread was about. So if you go back and watch the replay, you will see the housing uh, that's on this turb on this turbo. Um, and I also compare the old one to the new one. Uh, do I ever tune Evo? I sure do. I do tune Evos, not very frequently. Um, and honestly, it's because they're just so fucking easy. Evos are so easy to tune. They're the easiest car in the world to tune. Um, you put the right components in it, like, make it power in an Evo is so fucking easy, it's boring. Um, so, I don't get a lot of Evo tunes because I don't want to do a lot of Evo tunes because they're typically just like, oh, I got an exhaust on it and an intercooler core. And I'm like, yay, exhaust. I mean, there's, like, there's, there's no challenge to those. Um, it doesn't take any finesse. The tune an Evo, it's just the easiest car in the world to tune. That's why a lot of guys that were Evo tuners, when the Evo 10 came out, they were blowing them up left and right because they did not learn finesse. 4G tuners have no idea what it's like to tune with finesse. They have no idea to even understand how the engine works because a 4G is the easiest thing in the world to tune. You're like, okay, sure, one degree at 50 pounds of boost uh, at peak boost and then 11 at redline on ethanol you're good to go. Just fucking whatever. Like, this is the easiest car ever. You just, a couple degrees here, add boost, good to go. Keep the air fuels close. Right? There's, there's no challenge to a 4G. It's so boring. Now, you get a 4G with a standalone and a big turbo, some big injectors. I love doing that. That's a lot of fun. I like tuning a car on standalones. I love tuning any of on standalones. Uh, like, a link plug-in is just, like, perfect. I love it. And uh, I really do enjoy tuning Evos on standalones um, because I get to do all the other stuff that makes them run better than they do from the factory and the stuff that I do that makes them run better than almost everybody else that tunes them. Um, and I can say that without being arrogant. It's just what it is. I do different compensations than anybody else does. Link provides you with the ability to make maps that will do almost anything. I can, I can put like an optical sensor on your dash and change your tune based on time of day or the amount of sun in the sky. If I want to do that, I can do that with the link. Um, or, or an optical sensor on your paint color. You know what I mean? Like you can do whatever the fuck you want with a link and I love them. And so there's a lot of stuff I do with a link that's different than other guys. And I have guys that show up all the time tuned on links or hall techs or whatever by somebody else in the area that everyone thinks is like a great tuner and then they don't run that great, they don't start well. I spend five minutes with them and they start like factory and they drive smooth as glass. And it's just, just the way it is, man. I love tuning this downloads. I've been doing it for 25, 27, 27 years now, I guess. Uh, wow, you know. So, um, yeah, I love tuning them on that. But factory, you see the Evo stuff, boring. Tefra mod stuff, boring. I don't wanna do it. It's just boring. It's not exciting, it's not a challenge, it's not fun. Um, or it becomes too cumbersome. Reflash base tuning is just cumbersome as shit. Reflash, do a change, reflash, do a change. It's just not fun. But stand alone on the Evo, I love that shit. I'll do that shit all day. All day long. All right. Now.
Sorry, but I was right. Uh, I saw yours earlier. I thought I was your third. Oh, okay. It's the same one. So I did it for the hybrid. I, I bought seven housings from Mamba. About seven of them. Um, I have two for myself, five for tier one. Tier one did this one. The other two are for my own personal cars. Um, and I have those for that. So yeah, I do have it on my hybrid. And I do have it um, on this car and a couple others that we've sold already. And the results are good so far. I'm really excited. Um, Got a fun geometry question for you. Okay. Side A of a right triangle. How do I solve for it? If what, I know what's CMB? A? Oh. Well, A squared, B squared is C squared. Yeah. C squared would be the hypotenuse if it's yeah. a right triangle. So if you have... You I know you have, C and I know B. Okay, so then you just go... Uh, you take the square root of C, and then you go... Well, A squared... You gotta do a little math. So it's A squared, move the B squared over. So B, C squared minus B squared, square root of that, and then it gives you A. Or you do that, and then square root the A, the result. Nope. Just give me paper for it. I'll draw it for you real quick. Can you just do it in the calculator? Uh, yeah. So C is three. Okay. And uh, A or B is two. So it would be the square root of three. Minus the square root of B. So the answer is root two. So the square 2. root of two. 2.449. Yeah. Uh, what? This is what I have. You said it was three and one? Three and two. Oh, this is three and one. Oh, okay. Oh, that didn't work. There's more functions if you turn it sideways. 1.55, so let's just test that, 1.55 times 1.55 equals that, plus 4 equals that, and the square root of that is what? Let me do that. Sure. A squared plus B squared, you said it was 2, right? Yes. Yeah. Plus 4 equals... C squared. So 6.4. Oops, oh, damn it. I don't like this calculator for my Casio. I didn't do that right. So it's not 155. I don't know why I screwed up on that. I asked Tanner and I was like, I can't remember either. Ow. My hand's cramping. I gotta do anything by the hand. It's just A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Yeah, I know I know the, the correct way to do it. Yeah. So then you just you have uh, B moves over. So it's, oh, C squared minus B squared. That's where, that's where I screwed up. So it's nine minus four is five. So it's the square root of five. There you go. Sorry, my brain didn't work. Which is 2.23. So 2.24, technically. Okay. Okay, so if we do that again, 2.24 times 2.24 equals that, plus four equals, yeah, three. Nine is very good. So it's 2.24. Where'd you get nine? That's the C squared. Oh, right. got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. So it's 2.24? Yep. Okay. Because I need to find an angle, and the only way to do it is to hold it up in the car and then measure my leg, and then solve for my do, angle. Do you want an angle or do you want a leg? No, now that I know my, it's a right triangle. So now that I know my three sides, I can find out what the angle is. Just soak a toe with that shit? Yeah. Okay. Sure deal. Thank you. Yep. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, Cody, if Link doesn't have a GRPMP, just wiring one of those links to stand on those. Where you go? Oh, I'm, I'm way ahead. I'm way ahead now. Right. Hey, Dom. Hey, Bradley. If flow is the same and I lower back pressure, what happens? To boost goes down. So if flow is the same and you reduce back pressure, boost goes down. 
flow is the same and you increase back pressure, boost goes up. Because it needs to, right? In order to get the same flow through a smaller orifice or whatever it may be, you need more pressure to get that flow. <coughs> but with this housing, we're gonna get the same power at less boost than we got before. Because with the same flow rate at less boost than before. What the torque is? The torque is down a graph here. Clear. Come on. What are you doing? I think the G key's wearing out on this keyboard. Air fuels are really good, mid 11s, mid to low 11s. Yeah, boost only has like 16.4 pounds. And what's the torque at that point? Torque is. Wow! All right. The torque output in this car is almost 300 foot pounds of the wheels, which is what it would do on a normal housing at like 18 or 19 pounds of boost. So it's really good. Uh, let me show you. Actually, I'll pick the horsepower curve up too so you can see both of those really quick. Ah! We go. Oh, look at that. It's pretty. That's good looking. It carries nice. Look at that. That's a win, man. This housing is a win for sure. No excessive stupid boost spike. Nice and smooth and flat. That's a safer engine right there. That's the safest 280 wheel that Subaru's ever made. On a stock location turbo. That's really good. That's really damn good. Check the chat again, forgive me. My phone's not doing, I'm hitting the button though. How's this happening? There, try it again, there we go, all right. All right, so that's what I'm saying, okay. Uh, I don't think there is a link for a 24 STI. There is not. For a GR, I would run uh, Mtron or, uh, well, for a 14 Mtron. I would love to say a Haltech Elite 2500, but they honestly lack the inputs and outputs needed for that model uh, to use all the stuff that even the factory computer uses. So I wouldn't use the 2500 for that if you're a daily car, unless you're ready to buy the expansion module for other features too. Um, and a 14, they don't. Uh, Igor was saying they don't have the uh, the CAN bus stuff correct for the 14 model and talking with them before it doesn't sound like they're going to whereas Mtron does have it for that year so all the CAN bus info works um, so I would run an Mtron KV8 with a boom slang adapter harness on a 14 um, unless you find a used 2500 Elite for a really good fucking price then you can buy the Expando box and um, and kind of piggyback it and let the CAN bus do its own thing on factory ECU or ignore the CAN bus and make some shit happen. So uh, get a get a seven or eight inch screen in there in the dash right instead of the cluster and, and all of that it could be a lot of fun. But if you're looking to maintain all of the features and functionality, then I would say the Mtron, but it's it's an expensive unit. It's not cheap at all. Um, and then the, the harness is like $600 for the harness that you need. And then you still got to, you know, uh, get the wideband sensor. The, the, the KV-8 controls a sensor on its own. You just need to get the actual sensor itself. So you got to buy a nice NTK sensor and a few other things that slowly raise the price, you know, as you're getting things hashed out. Uh, but yeah, I'd run the, I'd run the Intron KV-8 with the boomstang harness. La, 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 la. Instead of you hitting that through, it's taking it behind me. Uh, push the back pressure. Two point two four. Yeah, I got it. <clears throat> I just didn't. I, I just didn't do the minus correctly. I mean, it was fucking simple. Like nine minus five, or nine minus four. 
is five squared five. Like once I once I said, oh wait, it's C minus B. Duh, it just came right out. But um, let's see. If I'm a math teacher. This is I have a square root is C squared minus B squared. Yep, correct. Yeah, and it's I mean, that's such an easy equation um, for a guy who has a degree in physics and uh, engineering technologies, not engineering technologies, and uh, I have one class from a mathematics degree, like, that's an easy one, I should be able to do it ahead a lot faster than I did, but, <clears throat> you know, sometimes you get a little rusty. When you get out of the math mode, right? All right, well, I'm gonna add a little more duty cycle to the wastegate, see what'll happen. Um, this looks like it's already about maxed out anyways. I mean, 70 some percent is pretty high for a factory turbo. Um, but I'm gonna add some to it and see if we can get a little more oomph out of it just to see what happens since we have this different housing on here. Uh, and the bigger door might, the bigger door will have more force, which will create a necessity to have a little more uh, actuation pressure to keep it shut. So we're gonna see what happens with a little more duty cycle. target 18 right here too. I'm gonna just bump the target up, see what the turbo does. And then, oh, I wanna add an IDC too. Make sure I don't exceed my injector duty cycle. I rarely have to log into duty cycle because I'm usually doing something that has way more injector than the turbo. I will do this poll, then I will answer that question that I saw come in. That's fourth? That's fourth, all right. more. Did it have any knock? Uh, nope, no knock. Everything's clean there. Duty cycle was definitely higher. Mass airflow uh, went up only a tiny, tiny bit in the top end, but it went up a little bit in the mid-range. Uh, ABCS looks good. Let's check this power curve. See how it went up more, especially on the bottom end. The extra duty cycle helped get a little more boost in the mid-range there, which got the torque to 300. You see the waviness of the dyno graph? That's the car moving on the dyno. I don't, you, I don't know if you saw in the video or not, the car was kind of rocking a little bit uh, when it loaded. Uh, I loaded a little abruptly. I probably should have smoothed that a little bit, but that created a slight wave on the dyno graph. Let me uh, clear that screen and bring up just the last pole. Get that oil smell again. There you go. Torque. And horsepower. I made 285. So it didn't do much on the top end, but it definitely added some mid-range to it. That's a win, man. That is a win. I say man, men, those that are still around, that is absolutely a win. Um, and no creep, no sign of creep, nothing. And that is, that's great. So I can create the same horsepower with less boost, less back pressure, less likely to knock due to less retained heat and less back pressure, less chance of boost creep, less chance of going lean. That's just a win in every front and power curve looks beautiful. It's so smooth. No torque spike, nothing. That is just, that's a win. So I'm saying to all you guys out there, if you are battling boost creep, or you just want a little more power out of your stock setup, I think the P20 housing is the way to go. Be super careful when you buy them online because it's confusing. There are two different ones, one for the ball bearing version of the VF and one for the non-ball bearing version of the VF. 
the non ball bearing version, the one that you want is harder to find than the ball bearing one. So you very, very easily can buy the wrong one. So be very conscious of which one you get. Um, but yeah, this can give you more power, more reliability, more longevity, and no boost creep without violating emissions or anything like that. That's a good way to go. I can't believe they made 285. Like on this dyno, for a car with stock fitment wheels and tires, that's a lot, especially in, in, for today. Add in these gigantic wheels and tires, that's really a lot. That's, um, I'm impressed. I'm excited, I'm excited to do more of them actually. I wanna do ones that have normal wheels and tires on there and see what happens. Maybe a car that doesn't smell like oil every time I do a pull. 167,000 miles. <laughs> this one might be, uh, this might be near its end. That's for sure. Who knows? So, it's an EJ. It's a turbo EJ. These things don't like last that long. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, again, I'm excited, happy. That was a win. I'm sure the customers are gonna be really excited and happy. Not to hear me say that it sounds like his engine toast, but you know, for the for the the gains that he got and the, the performance increase and just the, the smoothness, it just feels smoother. And um, we, we drove it on the street beforehand and it drives really nice. So, yeah, anyways, guys, that's it. That's the uh, end of the stream for today. I need to go home. I got dinner plans, I need to go home. So I will uh, test drive Matt's car one more time, see if that last flash helped out. Uh, hopefully it feels quicker than it, than it did before. I mean, it still moves, but the problem is the automatic, the way those things are programmed, they really run that higher RPM rev limit. And that's where the power was starting to fall on the top end, where the, the corrections were like really close to happening. So I actually think I need to reduce the shift points a smidge to keep the car in the power longer. Um, so reduce the automatic shift points to keep the car in the power longer, make it feel better than it does right now. So that's from BMW. Um, anyways, I gotta go. Thanks again, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, sw swing by the Discord channel. Subscribe or not. Say hi. You know, ask some questions if you want to uh, learn some stuff. Then subscribe for the educational shit. And I'll see you guys around. What's up, bud?